Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Shaft Podcast. My name is Andrews, and I'll be your host for this episode. Um, on this episode, we'll be hosting two individuals who have made history um, or solidified history that was made by Africans at the World Investors Debating Championship. They themselves have set their own individual best um, performances, uh, reshaped their personal narratives, and are here to share their stories as to um, what went into the effort, how they got there, and, and what's next for them on this journey of debating experiences. Um, so with me here is Kojua Champon and uh, Kelvin Kwabena Damte. Now these two are a team from KNEST who made the world's finals at the just ended World Investors Debate Championship that took place in Vietnam. With Kelvin also doubling as um, the world's public speaking champion. So I'll just do a quick intro of the two of them and then we can delve straight into um, the main discussions. But before that, um, do well to subscribe to this channel um, and then we'll bring you more and more of these interesting conversations. So Kojo Achampong, um, his debate career officially began in February 2020. Um, since then, he has risen to become the very best of debaters that you see within Africa within the past four years. Um, he has spoken in a total of five institutional finals, the Ghana Investors Debate Championship, um, uh, the Pan-African Investors Debate Championship, and the World Investors Debate Championship. And I was what three of them, right? So he's won one of the Pan-African Investors Debate Championships, which was the 2020 edition, and he's won the Ghana Investors Debate Championship 2022 and 2023. Um, he's back-to-back -back Ghanaian champion, like I said, and he's a two-time breaking debater at the World Investors Bay Championship. Um, just to highlight, he was also semi-finals at Madrid WDC, so um, being finalist at Panama WDC was um, an uplift of that performance, which is uh, a much commendable feat. Kelvin, who is his partner, um, is the current world's public speaking champion and the best ESL final speaker. Um, in addition to these achievements, he is also the only one to have appeared three consecutive times at the Ghana Investors Debate Championship um, debate and public speaking finals. He has also competed in debate and public speaking finals at the Pan-African Championships level, and he's also won the Ghana Investors Debate Championship um, in 2022. He's currently... Um, one of the best debaters you'd see in Africa and also uh, complements a lot the efforts that has gone into the team. So welcome to you, um, Kojo and Kelvin. Uh, how are you feeling? Let me start with you, Kojo. How are you feeling post WDC? Not as usual. I'm feeling as good as I can be. Everything is fine. <laughs> I hope you're, you're fine as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm doing great. Uh, Kelvin, how, how are you feeling? Uh, how has post-WDC experience been? I think the feeling has been great. The recognition, the positive attention, and uh, the duty to get back to the community is something that feels great. As I'm in a much better position to do that now. Awesome. Um, so... Of course, the performance at, at Vietnam WDC could have been um, maybe crowned in a much more grand way if if the trophy for the ESL came home. Regardless, it was an uplift of the performance that you saw, um, that you put forward in Madrid WDC. Um, we'll delve a little bit deeper into what changes you had to put, what kind of efforts, what kind of um, preparations you have to put in place. But there's one question I, I want to start this conversation with. And usually, debate, and especially um, at the highest level, disregards your personal opinion on things and just assigns you positions on issues that you may disagree with on a personal level, right? Um, so how do you, as elite debaters, reconcile debating positions that you disagree with in real life and how persuasive are you able to do these things how do you separate yourself from the debate topics that you eventually talk about and i'll start with you kelvin on this one so when i find a motion that i ordinarily disagree with 
the first is to realize during prep why I disagree with it and why those reasons do not count, especially argumentatively. And so we realize that most of the things that we disagree with are probably because we are not used to them or we have never probably given thought to having an open mind about these issues. And so it forces me to realize first why I do not agree with that issue and why, if I should, why it's better to go that way. So I just put myself in the debate and try to understand things from the side of the other person. And I think that once you are attacking the main issues that cause disagreement on that topic, it allows me to be far more persuasive as I'm actually trying to question myself. And if it's popular opinion, it means the opinion of the judges too. Yeah, um, before I move on to Kojo on this one, you, Kelvin, do you, um, in this instance, have to wholeheartedly assume the position as one that you believe in for the purpose of the debate? Or can you still maintain that conflicting disagreement and still argue persuasively? The reason why I'm asking this is because usually when we hear debaters speak about issues, you will think they 100% believe in these issues based on the passion, the, the kind of belief and the persuasiveness of, of their speeches. So do you assume like a world where you actually believe in this in order to have that debate convincingly, or you can still be convincing without necessarily picking up that identity or that personality for yourself? I try to stay in the middle as much as possible, especially because the other side usually has some merits. And so pushing okay. yourself to overwhelmingly side with their opposing view sometimes allows you to be overly glamorous and passionate. And that could mean you miss a few nuances. And so most debates happen in the middle and that's where I want to be. Okay, we'll talk about the middle part of debating a bit, but could you, what do you do? Do you find yourself in those situations? How do you reconcile your personal differences with motions that you have to debate? Okay, so the first, very first thing I do is to remind myself that this is a sport. It is not a reflection of what I believe in. And so at that particular moment, the most important thing for me, which I try to talk myself into believing, is that there's not an, a space for me to talk about what I believe in and how those things are important to me. But it's just a matter of getting the three points so I can break or maybe win the round, depending on what is at stake in the round. And so what that does for me is that it makes me rely more on my knowledge and experience as a debater than my personal preferences. By so doing, I'm, th I'm talking about recalling clashes in similar debates or maybe the stock yeah. arguments I might have heard. And I focus on playing around those things more than deep diving into me as a person and what I do believe in. If it's the flip to where it's emotion that I agree with, then of course I, for that particular instance, I inject myself and I try to explore, maybe try to see how crazy my thoughts are and how interesting they can be. But if I disagree with it, I just focus on the fact that it's a sport and try to use what I know about the sport to navigate the round. Yeah, but have you had instances where your your like thoughts that you've come up with within a debate about issues that you disagree with have eventually had an impact on your personal stance on those issues? So for instance, mm -hmm. um, maybe there's a controversial issue, you stand on one end of it, you are forced to debate the other side of it, and like Kelvin said, you are forced to explore reasons why that other side may be legitimate. And so have you had any instances, this may not be all instances, but have you had any instances where facing a side that you disagree with or having to advocate for a side that you say that you disagree with subsequently has implications on your personal perception, maybe shifts you from the extreme a little bit, maybe makes you now indifferent about the issue as opposed to taking an extreme stance? 
I would say that it's not, I have shifted on some of the issues, particularly because of my engagement with debates. Okay. But I would want to say that it's not just because of motions, first of all. And yeah. secondly, um, it's not just, even if that instance where it's because of active competitive debates, it's not just one singular debate. So it's an aggregate yeah. of two things having to debate these motions over and over again, but also being actively involved in debates as a community sports where we discuss yeah. some of these issues in training or just random discussion with friends. And the impact on me is that it has made me more moderate and indifferent okay. about a lot of things. And so now I do not have a straight standard opinion about a lot of issues. I'm usually just in the middle looking at um, how I can be able to contribute to the conversation without taking an active stance, particularly when I'm not in direct, I'm not in a position where my direct opinion or stance is required to give some benefits to the people involved in the issue. And so if that's not okay. the case, then I'm indifferent for most issues. But where that be the case, then it becomes a balance of who I am within debate and beyond debate. But for our other issues, so I'm not in a position to make any change. I'm just moderate or indifferent because of debating. Okay. Um, Kelvin, what about you? Do you have you had these experiences like Kojo where um, constant engagement with the debate community, constant engagement with motions gradually shift your views on issues from precept? or preconceived notions or stances to ones that are much more central and moderate on these issues? Yes, I, I think um, it's first based upon the debating community we engage in. First, because people have different experiences and are from different countries. And so yeah. it means then that, and this especially about economics and how economies are run, Coming from Ghana, we have certain economic frameworks that I thought, at least given our demography, was okay in principle, just that the information, implementation was wrong. But having to deal with people from other countries meant that even if I was defending an idea that I wholeheartedly agree with, the thought process it's you have to engage with and the benefits that others give as per other forms of implementation have changed have changed my mind a lot, especially about how countries should run and how leadership works for different groups of people. Yeah. Um, finally, on this stretch of conversation, which is something interesting you mentioned about how debate gradually makes you a centrist. Um, because I, I experienced that a lot of the time people ask me about my thoughts on issues and I'm like, I, I don't have a strict stance. I understand each other's perspective on these issues. And I think we just need to find a resolution that appeals to both sides. And usually it, I, there's, yeah. I, 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 I don't think, for, I don't think most people are centrist. Most people- No, 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 not, not most people. Yeah, most people have stances. Debate has the capacity to gradually make you a centrist. Like it, it just shifts you off your extreme okay. stance into understanding other people more. And usually, like we can we can disagree with the degree to which it changes people on mm -hmm. different spectrum because it changes different people differently. But I equally know debaters, and I know a lot of people around me. Of course, I know debaters who are who maintain their stance on issues no matter what. I can give examples, yeah. and we would also. <laughs> it. I also know some of them who have moved into the middle, and even in their conversations, they are clearly a center. They usually don't want to take a straight stance. Not because taking a stance is bad, because with all the information they have, they feel both sides are to some degree legitimate in different mm -hmm. ways and forms. Is that kind of indecision that comes with constant debating necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? Because like you said, there are points where you have to make a decision. And even for me, there are points where if you ask me to make a decision, I may still be indecisive regardless of how crucial that decision is. Do you think that tendency of debate gradually making you a centrist or pushing you towards the center to understand broader perspectives of issues 
and it's like limitation on the fact that you may not be bold enough or strong enough to pick a strong stance on issues does that have a tendency of destroying the way in which you would want discourse to progress or the way in which people should engage with the real world in terms of um, decision making and then taking the political stance on issues so yeah could you, you can that, start with this one so in the way in which discourse happens i don't think discourse is only at its best when the people involved in the conversation have stands or have taken sides already in the conversation because we can talk about a lot of issues draw conclusions propose solutions alternative yeah. view, and we can do all of this regardless of whether we have um, strong opinions about the way in which things should happen or not. And so in that instance, I, I think we can still be effective in contributing to discussions and making effective solutions. But I, to some extent, would also agree that in some instances too, it looks like indecision. In an instance where you are very much proximate to the issue and you taking a decision as early as possible, or even an opinion decision can cause some impact. Yeah. I think the indecision then becomes a harm. But for the most instances, you are still able to contribute to decisions, and even your indecisiveness can prove to be a better way for you to come at a better decision. Insofar as you have to make sure that whatever decision you are making at the end of the day is one that is well researched, well thought through and not biased in all its forms. And so that's yeah. how I think it plays out. Okay, okay. Kelvin, what about you? What are your thoughts on these? So I, I'm of the opinion that it doesn't make you more decisive. And the reason is even in debate, at every point in time, you do weigh in to shift the conversation to a specific side. And so yeah. I think the indecisiveness does not come ideologically. It comes because of the environment that you are in and how those opinions shape you. And so it may be an, an idea that in your environment, let's say at home, on your country, it's a very overwhelmingly popular opinion. And so to that extent, you're always having to battle with a lot of people with that opinion. It means at that yeah. important time, the space is not safe for you to say certain things, especially if you're thinking of appeasing both sides of the divide. And so it makes you really have a lot of considerations to make. And I, I'm of the opinion that that is the most safe situation to be in, even if it's called indecisiveness, especially because yeah. any decision you make, especially as a debater, who is seen as intellectual and well-read is something that a lot of people are going to take very seriously. And so approaching yeah. the conversation from a point where you are actively taking both sides into consideration is actually the best for you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've, I've had like certain uh, real life implications of this because I'm somehow disinterested in for instance, national politics, because mm -hmm. I think, like, I probably end up over analyzing parties or people that are standing. And then I have a feeling, yeah, both of them are the same. So I'm not interested in who wins. I, I don't think anything meaningfully changes. And then there are a lot of issues where, and, and it's more like as a debater also, because you want to be an efficient debater and you don't know which side you would fall on an issue, you are very cautious of taking a stance such that you are more invested in reading on the other extreme so you are equally comfortable discussing that other extreme when you get emotion and like the best of debaters like yourselves would want to have a good grasp of both sides of the issue and sometimes yeah it's it just ends you up in a space where because of the drive to be competitive regardless of the side you are on you actually end up feeding on information that empowers both sides to the degree that makes you indecisive on where exactly you are, right? 
I personally took it as a decision to be cautious of taking sides when I joined debate because I realized the freedom of thought gave me more competitive edge that I could sit in one debate and debate against God. And I could sit in the next round and advocate for Christianity. And in both rounds, I would, you think I'm saying something that I extremely believe in, but it may not necessarily reflect my personal views or my personal opinions, but it's just because that gave me much more competitive edge, right? So I was asking this because, I mean, you guys have gotten to the elite, extremely elite levels of, of worlds debating now, and you must have experienced some of these things in, in prepping, in competitions, in developing to the level that you are. So I just wanted to get a sense of it from some of the world's best about whether or not debating to the highest levels has the tendency to make you indecisive um, in exchange for being extremely competitive. I think it's important that I add that. I mean, part of me being moderate or centrist about a lot of issues was that yeah. I also didn't appreciate the way in which some debaters before that were before we came in the space had yeah. very strong opinions on certain issues. And you know how they run some of these things. So they make the space yeah. extremely uncomfortable for particular novice yeah. speakers that are also trying to find their feet and not, do not know how to appropriately discuss certain issues, whether it's their personal belief or not. And so seeing all of, I, I didn't want to see that happen to me and I didn't want to inflict the same level of pain on others. And so beyond their competitiveness, yeah. just how the space could be toxic at certain points in time, because certain debaters felt they had the moral high ground to shut particular people from engaging in particular spaces or conversations because yeah. they have different opinions. So that also accounted for that too. This is interesting. Is this to say being more moderate as debaters helps us make the debate space more inclusive? Then I guess being moderate and indecisive is not bad at all. It, it, like at least for the culture of the, the, the circuit, it's probably much more inclusive and oh, helpful. Yeah. Because between the two of us, we can just forget everything and do whatever we want to do um, to each other in terms of calling um, each other out on opinions. But for novice debaters, particularly who do not know how to appropriately discuss some of these issues, especially um, yeah. in, in Africa, because it's usually you are coming from a very, very conservative space to a debate space that, even if it's not liberal, allows um, yeah. for liberal discussion liberal to thoughts. happen. And so yeah. if we are not moderate or at least open to these discussions in the worst possible ways, it becomes very difficult for them to integrate and make a termination for themselves. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting perspective. Kelvin, what are your thoughts on these? Because um, per the conclusions that Kojo is leading to now, if you have people generally, like in Africa, generally people enter the debate space with degrees of conservativeness based on the social context that they come from. God knows the level of conservativeness that I entered the debate space with and, and how, how conservative I was. But then some of these views get extremely challenged based on, because like, imagine the, the most, almost the most popular first debate motion is this house would legalize abortion or this house would ban abortion. Yeah. And it's one of the most, the most controversial issues when it comes to a conservative and a liberal standpoint, right? And if you don't take care, you may get inflamed by people's arguments and then start calling people either they are conservatives and they are this and they are that and all that. Mm -hmm. And so do you think like being moderate not just helps minorities within the space feel much more comfortable, but also helps newer people who are entering the space with those conservative ideas at least get constructive engagement rather than an extreme interaction that are likely to make them feel this negative energy that pushes them away. Because we all know gradually they get assimilated into um, receiving the much more liberal or appreciating the much more liberal perspective on things. But at least at the initial engagements, does being within the middle give them much more room to get those corrections as time goes on? 
Yes, so I think the modern day concept of debating that focuses more on an equitable way of approaching issues meant that you do not come into a debate with your opinion necessarily yeah. trying to convince judges. I think the reason people become inflamed is because they realize that their ideas are not being taken seriously enough. And this is very pernicious when they personally agree with the ideas, even outside yeah. the game. And so um, equity conventions that will prevent me from calling someone a backward thinker for thinking abortion is better yeah. makes one the space thing. Because at a point where I listen to reasons why abortion is legitimate, it's more on why abortion should be legalized and less on why I'm a backward person. And so yeah. I think that that aspect of creating that environment, even if people do not become centrist, allows for people to um, make good judgments for themselves. I think the second one is one of the rare instances in which contact theory actually works. For yeah. it usually doesn't work, but for the debate environment, um, you may need to partner someone who is pro-abortionist. Your coach may be pro-abortionist. Um, you may crush on someone who is pro-abortionist. There, there are just so many things in the community that will force yeah. you to compromise. And that helps for the sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I agree with, I agree with these um, thoughts as well. So let's pivot and start delving a little bit deeper into your debate journeys, um, and then we'll, we'll work our way up towards Vietnam WDC. What was the first time you interacted with debate, and what sparked your interest in debate, Kelvin? Um, for intervarsity debate specifically, I think that my first experience with debate is, is a bit humiliating. Um, I was first called to debate by a member of our debate society, but at that point, I decided to focus on other things. Um, and so when my relationship ended, I remember that there was this guy who was worrying me to come and debate. And I felt that at that point, I needed somewhere where I could argue and win because um, <laughs> previously I've been arguing and I wasn't winning. And you eventually <laughs> lost it. <laughs> Is that the <laughs> um, I was craving an environment where I would argue and win. And that's just how yeah. I entered the debate space. So being broken hearted brought you into debate? Yes, essentially. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on it because you were hiding it in the big, big words <laughs> and, and people just needed to be clear on exactly what happened. Like, I just needed to point it out for everybody that like, you know, they, they put your hat on a chopping board. They did it, <laughs> served it on a plate as hot breakfast. <laughs> and then afterwards, you, you found your way back to, to a spot that has made you one of the greatest in it. So, could you, what was the first time you interacted with the beat and, and how did you get attracted to it? So my, the very first time I engaged in debates was in junior high school. And yeah. so all the way from junior high school to university was more of exploring in what ways does this thing look like now and how do I make the most of it? And so, you, you know, yeah. the usual um, JHS selection, they would sample yeah. the people with the best administrative essay. They would select stress. Yeah, exactly. Go on, that's that. I, di I didn't make the cuts uh, <laughs> because they just gave the... So they made the, the, the best students for the year yeah. and the principal speaker for both sides. <laughs> so he had to prepare for, he had to prepare against, and they just added yeah. two, two people to do each side. So I didn't make the cuts. And when I went to Opoku High School, I was like, okay, let me look at how it looks like now. And so the yeah. country which now Student Representative Council has an active debating unit. And so I engaged myself in that. And I was one of the best in Opoku High School. And so yeah. a part of the drive was also the fact that I was good in it, at least amongst okay. uh, my peers and 
it showed in when we went for regional competitions too. And yeah. so when I came to Ken USD, we had had some of the Opokuwa School alumni come back to tell us that, oh, debating is bigger in Ken USD, you should join the University Debating Society. And so I was looking at how it evolves in okay. to university debating, so what I knew, what does it look like now? And you know, they would come back with stories about tournaments and how interesting it is now, the 50 minutes thing. So it was just yeah. out of curiosity. When we came, I think um, Akofina was happening then. And so yeah. I had heard something about it. I followed it on Facebook. I made time to go and watch some of the rounds at Social So and eventually oh, okay. the final at Great Hall. Yeah. And so after all of this, I got to know of the recruitment process and I began university debating just because I was exploring what the sport looks like at this level. Why why does a part of me feel that you just wanted to get back at your GHS teachers? Who said <laughs> who said who said they will select you? Oh that was that was, I, it for I, SHS. that was it for that was it for uh, SHS. <laughs> but okay. as, after SHS, I was one of the best to it was purely exploration. <laughs> yeah, because in, in high school too, because me, I, I never heard of debate in JHS. In high school, when I heard of debate, um, they used to do these regional debate competitions, I think. Mm -hmm. And then they came to select the best English teach, um, students. <laughs> so uh, luckily, I made the best English students list. Mm -hmm. but I didn't make the debate speakers list. So the school prefects. A boys prefer is, is one speaker, girls prefer is another speaker. And then they found they found one speaker because I was from a science class, so already okay. the science and association with English there in high school they always say science <laughs> don't know how to speak they don't good trust it. So there was one from uh, general arts who, who was also part of the top English students, and then that person was third speaker. I sat on the bench throughout. <laughs> throughout while we lost Charlie. But yeah, yeah. For me, for instance, joining debate was like not getting back, but just proving to myself that I could I could do it. The part of it that was underlining it was actually because I was I was supposed to go to uh, Pesco and then I couldn't get to go for some reason. Okay. Like in terms of high school. So I couldn't get to go. So when I came in and I said, Oh, the debate society has these big schools and then they, my entire goal was just to go there and then prove to myself that once I beat you from one big school, I could have attended the school. It's just circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> so for every single big school I beat, the first person on my chopping board was Eden Boso. Because Ampa uh -huh. used him to threaten me to convince me to go and join the debate society. When I beat Eden Boso, it means that I could have attended Presec. <laughs> started like that but yeah, yeah those are like unique unique stuff um your debate journeys have been quite different but also in, in the past years a little bit similar in terms of competitions that you've done um tell me about your mood at madrid um post that semi-final loss what resolutions you had from there and then what efforts you put in after that because i'm sure the performance at vietnam at least has something to do with that experience in madrid um and we would later delve into the differences between the two experiences but what was the mood like when when you exited at the semi-finals in madrid let me start with you could you how did you feel <laughs> that 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 lost in madrid affected me in multiple ways because of the different things that I was going into the tournament. And so a part of me was expected to be happy. A part of me was also expected to be sad. So it's really a roller coaster of emotions. So I was the captain of the Kenya City debate team then. And mm -hmm. we had two teams in the semifinals. And so we had both uh, qualified fourth and fifth positions into the semis okay. and we're happy together as one team and then we had to meet in the final in the semi-final for that tournament yeah. and then we did what we could from we in the short diagonal so zagreb was closing us and then i think Bimus happened to be in opening government so we had done okay. what we could do 
in opening opposition. Then closing government also came to do what they thought was good for them to advance in the in the in the round. Yeah. And you know, you know, with Ken West, we we don't um, when we meet each other in rounds, <laughs> the plan is not to try to beef um, the uh, clashes up. By just yeah, to yeah, yeah. ensure that we are both at the top of our game, yeah. and so after that round, after that round, and then subsequently the announcement came. I was a bit um, sad because of, I mean, the fact that I couldn't progress. Yeah. But particularly because of how the debates um, played out. To you know, one of those things um, that yeah. happens in, in debates where you probably think that oh, a team. Um, could have avoided doing certain things to your team just to make it a better yeah. case. So all of those issues were there. But at the same time, too, I was the leader of the delegation. And so I had to, um, and it was history. So I had to also find a way to cheer up the team and then also engage with them on how we can have a very good round in, in representation yeah. in the final. And so I would say because of that, I was not able to experience both emotions in the best possible way because I couldn't exert my pain out of um, losing out very well or yeah, in ways that yeah. were vocal to me. Neither could yeah. I have also expressed my happiness um, in yeah. ways that were also meaningful to me and the people that deserve to see me happy yeah, and to see you happy. happy for them. So it was just a terrible experience that night and throughout the final. But eventually, I I came out of it um, and decided to do what was best for myself, which is prioritizing my my role in the team as the head of delegation, and then talking yeah. out with Prosper and Vincent and fully support them in the final. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like these are these things are one of the the most conflicting things you can experience as as an individual and especially with people in, in leadership positions. And as you would notice, like people before you have experienced similar things, people after you have experienced similar things and everybody reacts to it in, in different ways. Um, and I think like sharing this here would also help whoever listens who down the line finds themselves in, in those situations because these are not uncommon situations. Like how many times do leaders of delegation go to like nationals, mm -hmm. funds, worlds, and and end up in situations where their personal goals have been cut short, but then that of the team is still on course. And so you are wondering, how do I react with the sadness of my individual journey coming to an end while still reacting with the joy of the team's journey moving on? Exactly. And sometimes it's really difficult putting yourself aside and then looking at the team and and it's a tough call that a lot of people have to make but then that's why i would say that maybe within a leadership role it in itself is a recognition that you are always second to the team to some extent and then when those two interests clash you have to like be the sacrificial lamb and then prioritize the team's interest and, and support the team Kelvin, you, you, your emotion, you could cry as, as much as you wanted because you were not in Kojo's position. You were not team captain. But yeah, let me ask you, how did you feel about that, that loss in Madrid? Also, to be very frank, I think it was a lot in terms of the fact that first we had won all in round nationals and a PADC when we were all. Okay. I think even at the okay. time, we had had that experience. And so um, to see us exit from PAGC service from a role okay. we had a hundred percent spin rate in and to be able yeah. that we had replicated in WGC um, was yeah. a tough situation for me strategically. For personal opinion, I am of the opinion that we deserved the break. We just didn't get yeah. it. And so I think what it prompted me to do was to do more judging in terms of realizing that first, we didn't advance on a split. 
it means that okay. you didn't convince the majority of judges and yeah. you probably just convinced um, the audience. And so it, it pushed me more to do that. I will not say that I was sad because I didn't brief. I think I failed too many times, a lot of times in my career, to realize that failure is part of the sport. The sadness was because of how the round went, and let's say my expectations of the round after the debate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about expectations in a little bit, not even just after that round. When you went into, into WDC in Madrid, initially, what were the expectations? along the competition did expectation change right because i know that the degree of pain you feel when you lose is equally dependent on how much expectation you had um, of yourself right so somebody who reached semi-finals and jubilate and deliver the speech like uh, i didn't even expect to reach here thank you very much and sacrifice the speech and go and sit down and they are extremely happy for their lives somebody who expects the trophy would even get a second place and be sad right so I mean, what was your expectations as a team moving into the competition? Did those expectations evolve along the line? And, and did that contribute to the degree to which you were unhappy about the results that you had in Madrid? So I am of the opinion that pre the round, the, pre the tournament, the training and everything that went in were as much as possible to secure an open break. Um, yeah. It's just the complex complexity that comes with it. I, um, if the tournament is small, once you break ESL, yeah, you are a semi finalist. But once you break open to get to the quarter final, <laughs> it's a lot of head on. It's, it's a, a long journey. Head. Exactly. Yeah. So people that one who is a partial auto finalist mm -hmm. probably perform more than someone who is a finalist elsewhere. I think yeah. at the very beginning of the tournament, uh, meeting Ashish, we were very confident that we were on track. At the end yeah. of the two, we realized pretty quickly that we were far off from achieving our goal of making a game. And so <laughs> the adaptation was to make sure that on day three, we get as much Pointers, as many points as possible, but realistic. Yeah. Especially because we knew we could break open as a 10 if we had nine points, but we were trying to be yeah. as realistic as possible. And we had okay. eight points and advanced to the ESL semifinal. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Also, like, it's like a typical WDC experience for, for most people, or at least for most Africans, right? Like, the one you are pretty good day two plummet because you you have like the harder rooms because of the good performances in day one and then day three is is the do or die stage where you either enter the bricks or you go home crying like but yeah i i i understand like the way in which the tournament dynamics shifts shifts these expectations and so like post madrid and post the experience there um what was let me ask you to was there any team resolution that yo okay we've lost madrid we are working towards vietnam or did you individually make independent resolutions and then eventually you still had to speak together as a team which then um culminated together in you guys performing in vietnam did you had like a resolution as a team after madrid could you I would say both things happened. <laughs> okay. But, um, I mean, you, you know some part of our story that we both had yeah. that different parts. And then the very first time that we came to speak together was at Nationals 22. And yeah. that was the first time Kevin and I were speaking together. And yeah. we won Nationals 22, went into the PADC. We broke, almost broke that, but we ended up breaking tech <laughs> and then uh, we went into uh, madrid and so post madrid i mean part yeah. of us came back to who we who we were before we started um, speaking together so we had different yeah. partnerships and we had different 
focus. So I had to focus more on my work with the Kenya yeah. CHLT yeah. while still trying to balance it out with debates. And Kelvin also had his own thing going on. But then at the back of our minds, we knew that we are most likely going to be a team for the next season of institutional yeah. tournaments. And so we would try to spar together, try to check up on what each other is doing at certain points in time, and just try yeah. to grow. So the point was grow for the team, but also have okay. enough time to do what you want to do, because you are most likely yeah. going to be on the same boats together. And so yeah. personal resolutions happened, team resolutions happened. That's a stage. Yeah, Kevin, what was your personal resolution like post Madrid? I think my personal resolution was to judge more and more, especially because yeah. in Madrid I was judging, but I was not fully integrated into the global understanding of what debate is. And so yeah. I decided that if I lost the semi final with a strategy that I had spent um, a year with my teammates perfecting. And it, it meant that we, I needed two things. One, more judging, and especially more out-round judging to yeah. be able to achieve the optimal results um, that yeah. I was looking for. And so that was what I committed to. And so I judged a lot of tournaments, specifically prioritizing the international level because I judged enough at the African stage to know how judging okay. works in Africa. But I wanted to comment more into what it takes to convince a diverse panel, most importantly, yeah. especially because we always have some panelists agreeing with us, but their circuits have yeah. different priorities, different understandings of certain things. And so a diverse judging environment was what I looked forward to. Post okay okay but uh, i i just want to get a sense of this that like debating can sometimes be mentally and emotionally draining like and a lot of the time we probably don't recognize how much of a mental and emotional toll it takes on us until we are maybe out of like a very competitive season and then you are trying to find yourself and then you realize you're like this has been really stressful. This has been really draining, right? How much of a toll have you experienced within these very competitive debate seasons, like nationals, PADC, WDC, which is usually like the last quarter of the year, like the latter parts of the year, right? How much emotional and mental toll have you experienced within these periods? And like, how do you deal with it? How do you think people should deal with these mental and emotional um, stressful scenarios that they interact with yeah could you if you can start with this one for me okay so i'll i'll just want to begin by stating that i think i'm not the best of persons to <laughs> um, to advise on how to handle this particular stress because yeah for me for all i try as much as possible to do very few external tournaments as possible just so I can avoid the mental stress. Avoid the stress. Okay. Exactly. And so you can see probably in the debate calendar, I just do one or two externals and then I'm done. People yeah. do all of the tournaments that they can get their hands on. And even in terms of judging, I just still try as much as possible to do one or two per month or something. Insofar as I'm still able to go at my own pace while avoiding the stress. So the best advice from me is to do the tournament and save yourself. But then, given that COVID also um, disrupted the academic calendar, we have had two years where PADC, I mean, GUDC first nationals, the regional PADC and WDC yeah. all happens um, within the, the same period. And so, yeah. for me, the stress obviously becomes unavoidable. But you also yeah. understand that each tournament has its own um, different dynamic. level. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly the, the issues that would disturb you 
about the tournament before you even go down to your debate yeah. team and how yeah, those things yeah, are yeah. out. And so, first of all, I try to stay out of all the other issues, the drama that happens within a, a circuit. And <laughs> it's just easier for me when I'm not in, in, the, in the midst of those so that I can just focus on the rounds, whether I'm blaming the judges, whether I'm blaming myself, blaming my partner. <laughs> But I think another thing that yeah. helped me is that as as a person, yeah. my emotions are very, very time bound. And so I'm very quick to move on to the next thing. And so maybe it's manifest in ways like after a round, I, I have all of those emotions coming through. But after yeah. a round, I mean, it just goes away so I can focus on the next thing. And so that also helps me. So I don't know how I do it. The only thing I do is just to avoid as much tournaments as I can to avoid the stress. But with the competitive seasons, it's just a trait that I have to quickly move on to the next issues. Yeah. Um, I mean, that like competitive tournaments can be so dreamy. I, I was having a conversation with someone recently and I told them, like, Korea Worlds is the most difficult competition I've done in my entire <laughs> like debating career. And it's not difficult, like, in the sense of, like, maybe debate motion wise difficult is the competition where i felt like every single round i was regressing in mm. terms of my individual assessment of my performance and this was not even results based because I, I i've had terrible runs of debating competitions and all of them i know that like yo i'm putting in my best maybe this one is not going well that was the competition where every single round i could genuinely blame myself for underperforming and it was getting worse every single round. So it was like this huge thing of load on you. And then after every round, it was just pressing you down and down and down. And it was extremely crushing. And, I, I don't I know till that, today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, I just think that the for GDC and PADC, you know that after a bad round, you are certain that you are going to come back because of who yeah, you are in the, the school, dynamics of the room. Your ability yeah. to engage with the debaters. But with WDC, it's 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 very, very different because the tournament is very, very huge. And so the yeah. room that you find yourself in, even after a bad day, is potentially the top room for a tournament elsewhere. Yeah. And so it's I think the assessment happens after a day, then uh, maybe today we had four out of six or four out of nine. And tomorrow we are getting three out of nine. It's very, very draining. It's very, very draining. And like you were explaining, yeah. it weighs very heavy on you, especially if you are assessing yourself after uh, groups of rounds and not individual rounds. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, Korea WDC was the first online, which mm -hmm. had like over 500 teams, um, <laughs> like a very huge number of people, boy, like yeah. so huge. The competition was so huge. And it was taking an extreme to like Belgrade had its own stress mm -hmm. because for Belgrade, it wasn't really the toll on the competition. I just physically felt tired. So even after the second round, and it was surprising because we we're just doing two rounds of debate at Belgrade. Yeah. After the second round, before feedback is done, I usually fall asleep and then wake up like two or three hours later. I had to take a power nap before I could later call Erasmus and then would have a chat about how the day went. And I, I couldn't understand because how do we do two rounds of online debating and it makes me so physically tired. When I've done online competitions throughout the year where we do four rounds of debating in a day, right? And it just tells me like, yo, the dynamics of stress in big comps like Worlds, it's just way too complicated like for you sometimes when you're as an individual interacting with it. Yeah, Kelvin, you are you impermeable to stress, or you do you have your your crybaby moments? I think I'm usually um, clear-headed in tournaments, especially first because of the amount of preparation I put in. So if I enter a tournament because I'm not prepared, and I just probably had to do it because I'm bored, or I have to do something, my expectations are. Yeah. Prepared. It means that I really care less about what happens. But secondly, okay. uh, I think that I've had people like you, Erasmus, Banaman, um, even at the time when I felt I was at the peak of my career, 
then. There were still things that I had to work on. And so I could be in finals of a tournament and the feedback I get sounds as critical as someone who <laughs> did not break. And so for yeah. me, it was, it's, I think that kind of realization pushed me to be less result oriented and more growth oriented. It meant that if I am doing one round a day or spending 15 minutes a day on training, I'm asking myself, am I better than the debater I was yesterday? If I lose a round, did I do something better, which I didn't do? Yeah. And so I think that whether you are results oriented or not, you have to grow because even if you are results oriented, if you do not grow, you do not get results unless you're trying to cheat or something. And so yeah. it means that that model of chasing growth made me far less stressful, especially because um, hitting on past rounds without learning from it and picking nuggets of growth means that you were not supposed to grow. And even if yeah. you are result-oriented, looking at past losses and not learning from them is also not a result-oriented strategy. And so that's how I just manage every tournament round by round. Yeah. I mean, that's it's usually a difficult thing to do, actually, to like ignore um, results and just follow the process. Uh, there were periods like... Or there are certain levels of performance that sometimes I genuinely have equally have to ignore the results. Because, like for instance, if you are trying out a new strategy and you know that it's the good strategy for you, but you are not perfect at it yet. And so at its inception, you are sort of fluctuating in the results. But you yourself know that it's a process. And so you need like to keep your eye on the process, keep doing it, and then you eventually get the results as well. But let me then pivot to Vietnam. How calm were you entering into Vietnam WDC compared to Madrid? Were you now much more calm because of the experience you had? You knew clearly what the expectations were. Also because, like, for instance, Kelvin, you had done more judging prior to Vietnam this time. Um, could you, you have taken, you had won nationals again. You've still built up the confidence. Um, how calm were you guys approaching Vietnam WDC? Kelvin. And so I think um, pre the tournament, it was a lot of stress, especially because we yeah. had done the India WDC fundraiser. And I think we yeah. just amassed four points. And wow. we have done spa after spa, and we were losing. Also, I think the best we got at some point was still a fourth, but with a two-one split. And so I kept asking myself, I, <laughs> am I the same guy I was? And yeah. the, the moments of judging really count because I, I literally spent the year learning how to convince people. And yeah. so at the time where I need to convince them the most, I am as unpersuasive as possible. But um, I decided to seek help from people who are in similar situations, um, like Rune yeah. and um, David. And they were able to first do the regular, I call it Asian dad encouragement. And I also had a lot of thoughts. And so <laughs> yeah. I felt that, that um, others had also lost, and I'm not the first to do it. But, I think approaching Madrid and um, Vietnam, when we saw yeah. the first motion, it's a motion that I had encountered while debating against uh, Kat Chen, Kate Hill. And so yeah. I knew how the debates would play, and I had so many arguments. I could literally speak for 30 minutes. And so knowing like that's the first, you meet a good motion, you're on a good side, it's made the tournament for me start on a very positive note. I think yeah. the first came in in round two, where we met Hadar and Mark and Alina from Oxford. And so that yeah. was when I was like, well, 
round one was good, but this is not the kind of round two I expected. Especially yeah. because I usually expect to start struggling by round three. And so I started going through the top to realize that some teams had won the round, but they are not beating Mark, they are not beating really Hada. So what happened and why are we here? It's it seriously took a toll on me. And <laughs> you have to yeah. realize that I can beat them. You know you can't, but you have to enter the room with that mindset. Yeah. And I think the round two motion was probably the toughest in the tournament. And so I moved from very calm to very distressed really quick. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, maybe the, the consolation there is that, like you said, that is not the ideal trajectory you're expecting the tournament to go. Um, but also that's not going to be like your everyday room right but like regardless eventually that's the kind of level you would you would want to be um want to meet these guys like want to go shoulder to shoulder with them and of course it would come like with with this level that you are you guys are on now hopefully within the next debating year by the time the cycle comes to an end you should you would be much more comfortable like engaging some of the the best in the world, like shoulder to shoulder in these open breaking rooms, in these higher rooms as well, right? Yep. So, like, back to you, Kojo. How did the preliminary rounds go um, before we talk about the out rounds and then the grand final itself? Okay, so I've already mentioned that I'm stressed at this. And so going into the yeah. tournament, I was very relaxed, regardless of how prep was going as Kelvin has already explained. One thing that has helped me particularly in preparation, like balancing the period between preparation and going into tournaments, is that I've come to understand that tournament dynamics is a whole new world on its own in comparison yeah. to preparatory dynamics in that you can yeah. have a very, very good preparation and then you have a terrible comp and the reverse can also happen to you. And so I was very relaxed and very much eager for the tournament to begin so that you'll be able to know how much we've grown as a team yeah. and how that expelled because that would play out in the rounds. So the first round yeah. we were in opposition, we won the round and Milos was the chair and he was very, very happy about how we approached the debates. I mean, we did all the good stuff according to him. And so yeah. that was um, good. At least we, we knew that we had mastered open opposition enough to win in yeah. round. The next round, we, we had to close Hada and Tama with Aniket and Mark in the diagonal. And then we had Elena in CU. For me, because in the obvious way the round would play out, we will be taking the fourth. I just didn't count that round much in yeah. terms of measuring how far we, we, we've gone, because regardless of how far we've gone, the obvious rankings are obviously still not in our favor. And so that's not yeah. happening. And then with the next round, we were close in opposition. Um, early judged that round, we took a third. And so that's raised questions about the team in closing, when we are coming yeah. in from closing. And because it also played on to some of the things that we got in terms of feedback in the previous round from, um, I think, Sharuka. So, yeah. Then we went into the next round where opening, we won from OG. And so the conclusion at that point was that you guys are settled in opening. <laughs> opening opening fanboys. <laughs> yeah. Closing <laughs> tears <laughs> Avengers. <laughs> so closing then becomes the issue. And yeah. through to this observation, we CG the next round and we took a fourth. So, <laughs> so it meant that we had to discuss extensively and seek actively for feedback on how to yeah. approach closings. And I don't know whether if we it's whether it's an error on our part to apply the feedback or that yeah. we couldn't just also sufficiently apply the feedback in within like a small space of time, but we had a hundred percent. I mean, results in opening. So we yeah. won all OGs and OOs, except for the final where we lost 
<laughs> from which but then he yeah. kept on getting hurt and fought in in closing and so this this that, that was just like this brings me to the 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 semis and the finals right mm-hmm. i mean you had mentioned that you had a, a perfect streak in, in openings you had opening up in the semis um i personally watched the semis like you guys put in very impressive performances uh, the question i want to ask is how did you feel how much relief did you feel after hearing that you broke to the finals because i i have this note in my mind even when i like PADC, for instance, mm-hmm. in in Tanzania when I was in semifinals in 2018, and then Akofana came. When the semifinals were happening, the thing that was playing out in my mind, even though a debate was going on, was how will I feel about myself if I don't make it past here? Like then, what was my experience as a semifinalist for? Like you put a higher burden of expectation on yourself to at least go beyond it, right? Um, how do you feel? How did you feel? How much relief did it come with to know that at least you've you've made that dream that you had in Madrid now a possibility and now it was one more step to go? I don't want us to delve into the finals just yet. Okay. What was the feeling after the results for semis were announced? It was just a very, very simple feeling. It was finally, if, you, if you've made it. <laughs> And that that was just it, because before yeah. the announcement, I was trying to console myself. Not that I yeah. don't think I think we 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 didn't do well in the semis. I think we did extremely well, but yeah. I was just I mean you know anything can happen. So I just tried yeah, to console myself the with debate. the stories of um, other people that did better in tournaments in the previous years, and then didn't do yeah. as much as they did. I was also trying to reconcile the fact that in the worst case scenario, we have made semis, which is where we were. But even beyond that too, we had broken higher, we had a higher community speaker score. And so it was basically just trying to balance the excitement the I was yeah. from breaking and then the disappointment from no breaking. And so I was in the middle in terms of emotions before the announcement and when the announcement happened because Tell me, when you were looking so. forward to good news <laughs> when you're looking forward to good news could you was arranging a will as to when the bad news comes <laughs> how, so, how will you guys deal with it he was so prepping had, a speech to give you when you lose oh <laughs> so i had i had experienced the joy of breaking and i had experienced yeah. the sadness of no breaking even before the yeah. announcements came through so it was just, oh, okay. made it. Let's see what, okay. what becomes of this. Yeah, Kelvin, how did you feel about it? I I was a bit tensed going into the round for opening uh, the position, especially because yeah. of the trauma from the past PADC and the past <laughs> Madrid event. Yeah. So my strategy in DL was to make sure that I avoid being outclassed by closing. And so yeah. I was very specific about CG especially and what the most important thing should be from our side to make sure okay. that there is no way a closing team is sneaking in. Probably they could sneak in ahead of OG. That was fine. Yeah. But not to sneak in ahead of our team. And I had made a mental note on feedback that the judges had given us and so yeah. it was just um, having a lot of sheets with a lot of content and i had to just move with the strategy that best works to make sure that i don't repeat the same things that happened in my yeah. such that at least if we still lost we would have lost for a completely different reason and not for the same yeah. reason we lost in Madrid. And knowing that we had achieved that as a team when the results were announced was just it for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, these emotions are, are ones that personally I would probably have to wait to try and experience them in the future because as sad as it may sound, I don't know how to feel. I don't know how it feels to be a world's finalist. So, 
like I know how it feels to be a world's masters finalist. Like that's that's the grand of of world's finalists. I don't know how it feels to be a mega world's finalist at the ESL level. So, it's so but but yeah, 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 I mean that's just by the way. Like a quick question though for you guys, if you if you had to choose between um, an ESL final and then an open octo final, which one would you pick? Could you? This one, no consultation. Could you between an ESL and the ESL final ESL and an final, octo uh, uh, ESL final? ESL no, final. Uh, no open octos. You don't like open octos. <laughs> hey. I'll, I'll choose the ESL final. Okay. It's open break. Oh, you don't like open breaks. I mean, I have unfinished business, so <laughs> I'll want to settle the ESL final before I yeah go, before you go to open. what happens in open breaks. Yeah, Kelvin, what about you? Which one are you picking? ESL finals or open octos? Why? I think, personally, the best you could get in the final is to be the best in the final. And as ESL finals, I think I think that's enough. And so, a final again is something yeah. that. I and mean, it means that you are closer to the trophy, to yeah. the world's trophy, ultimately. Yeah. But I feel my career has always been one of growth. And so the point of growth is to be in octo finals at the open stage. Okay. And I feel we have enough experience to cross yeah. the octos should we get there. Okay, okay. I mean, you don't get to reset the question I asked you, so don't tell me you cross the octus. I asked you a specific <laughs> question about whether or not you prefer octus yeah. to, to ESL well, finals. I would like to have something on my CV that's not ESL because I have two of yeah. them already on my CV. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I get you. I get you. Like, um, if if you look at a, a Doxbridge Opens finalist like myself, it's it's a it's a great experience. So you'd want yeah, to experience about that. Andy, the world's the world's experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Doxbridge Worlds uh, uh, <laughs> Open finalist like myself. I mean, you guys would want to experience it. So I understand. I understand the feeling. But um, let's come because we would have to wrap up in about like fifteen minutes time. Let's come to the world's final itself i mean it was a huge stage to be on it's a stage that i i admire a lot because it's it's one of the things where even no matter this the level of experience you have you look forward to either seeing yourself there or seeing other people there and seeing you guys there um on that stage was was an amazing experience like what was the experience like for you and what did the results mean to you um could you let's let's take it from you since you are the less emotional person and you are the one who moves on early let me ask you before i go to open now who will give me seven chronicles of emotions about how he felt so so, so yeah for someone who tries to avoid external tournaments and i do institutional tournaments because they are the only tournaments i cannot opt out even if <laughs> i'd wanted to it's not like i've been there before Maybe yeah. the name has changed, but then it was going to be my first final for Ken University. And so I yeah. was just trying to play on to my past experiences. Um, first year PADC finals, third year final year. Um, I had two, na two national finals and even we had made yeah. PADC finals. And so it's like, this is the first time you've been here before. That kept me calm, that kept me relaxed moving into the finals. Then yeah. we did the balloting and we're opening government. And it's also looked like you have been here before. You have won in opening government. You are doing extremely well in OG. The feedback said yeah. so. And you've had amazing judges and amazing speakers confirm this. Yeah. And so it was all through going into the final through the ballot and um, through the balloting process. I think. I got shocked when the, the motion was announced because it looked like an open motion. But then Luigi says it's not an open, <laughs> it's not an, a, it's yeah. not an open motion, and it's it's worth discussing. And yeah. but then going into prep, it was like you have done this before, and which means yeah. that you are most likely going to 
it's in, within your reach and your capacity to replicate it. And so that was what we, we did. We did what we had been doing, took notice of the feedback we had gotten and tried to be as yeah. clear as, as possible. It was after the final that because of the conflicting opinions about the final, um, I think it, it got to me at some point because some people had doubts about their, their speeches and other people were also very confident about their speeches. And so at the end of the day, even before the results came in, I was convinced that I did the best PM that Kojo Pokwe Champon can give in that final because yeah. maybe people had their reasons why they doubted the speech, but insofar as sometimes for the same reason, other people think the speech was good. Yeah, 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 for exactly. other people, Some people think the speech was good. I knew that at least I had given the 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 a, a, the good a, a very good PM speech that I can be yeah. proud of whenever I go to listen to the round. So I was just it. Um, I was just waiting for the icing on the cake which would have crowned <laughs> this speech. Yeah. And maybe hope that um, you could analyze the speech, just like we analyze Buso's speech. <laughs> if you uh, have, uh, uh, but since uh, it didn't win, yeah, yeah. it looks like I, <laughs> I have to pick another OG again. Right? <laughs> See? Bro, like, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying, because there, there's barely a debate speech that has a consensus opinion on it like even worlds mm -hmm. i i personally disagree with some world's winning speeches i i don't think they were convincing enough even <laughs> though of course me myself i've not even been in the finals yet so like my opinion but everybody holds their opinion depending on and that's the beauty of debates the subjectivity it allows exactly. within the sport and and there's this thing that people say that like the very things that make people dislike you are the very things that those who like you like you for right and so the very things like you said the very things that make people not like that speech so much are probably the same things that make other people like the speech and so there is like little you can do about it and and that's the thing usually i just tell people if you know you did your best that's the best you can give to yourself because the rest is really up to judges and sometimes these close decisions um, um just happened as well kelvin what what was your experience i mean you were finals best speaker so i would say you should probably be happy and satisfied with yourself but of course you still lost the trophy so either tell me how sad were you um i was not really sad i think it was because first has happened again um, yeah um, it was uh, second time in the year that I was going to lose a final on a 4-3 split. Um, I had lost Hogwarts final to you in a similar fashion. And so I think that both takeaways okay, you haven't won. Yeah. Were, were that in both finals, I had yeah. the best speech responsibly. And so yeah. it spoke a lot to who I am as a responsive speaker. I've always said yeah. that you could have your favorites, but I am Africa's best whip at the moment and probably in the next few years. But to have a... Wait, wait until I return to whipping. You are, you are making a hasty judgment. <laughs> yes, yeah, so for you to <laughs> return, it's probably one of those things you do. You enter tournaments when I'm not around and you have a future with everybody you are doing great. Okay, but it's okay. I Return to the question I asked. Yes. The fact that you are inspired by the fact that I have such an achievement is what pushes me to do these things more and more. <laughs> that once yeah. an African is ESL said, finals best speaker, and you yeah. still can look at it and say, wow, I also want to return to debating. I also want to win such an award. It's something that was great for me, that generations can watch our videos. Um, maybe <laughs> we didn't win, but they can watch and yeah. see that an African or Africans came so close to yeah. winning WEGC, especially as per the dynamics of the tournament. It was a no-brainer that opening a position 
was the role to win unanimously from. And so knowing that we gave OO a tough run was yeah. it for me, especially given the dynamics of the tournament. Yeah, I mean, like like we are saying, these things are, are maybe like for a lot of us, it, it probably we may not see it now, but they are very inspirational because the the mentality with which you now approach and it, it started from like Madrid, right? When Prosper Vincent Elisha Wesley made ESL finals, it, it created a mental picture that you it's possible, and now you guys have made ESL finals. You have taken it a step further, become ESL best speaker, made it even much tougher for the judges to decide who won. Now that mental picture is becoming consistent in our minds. Ah, it is possible. Like it, it, because you see, once it's like maybe a chance, but twice and three times establishes a trend of possibility, right? And and this twice like tells us you know, it's it's actually possible. It wasn't a one-off thing that happened in Madrid. It's it's a thing that is possible to repeat. And once you put in the effort, you can actually get there. Like which is a huge block of inspiration that a lot of us should should get from it. Now to like the final stretch of of questions that I have for you guys. Like, I mean, you've you've now been to the highest level of competitive university debating. You are world's finalists, um, world's best um, ESL speaker in the finals, um, world's public speaking uh, champion as well. You've you've demonstrated in the most tense and in the most competitive environments how persuasive you are, how knowledgeable you are, etc. What do you look forward to in the in the coming year to utilize these skills for, like in mainstream, in the debating space? What should people be expecting from you as individuals and from you as a team? And I'll, I'll start with Kelvin on this one. Yes. Yeah, so I think making the final allowed me to get something done that I intended to get done in 2023. That is to move to um, more coaching at a point where I felt I'm satisfied with my career. And I only showed up, showed up at Vietnam because I felt I had something to prove to myself as a speaker. And so yeah. going into this year, I have taken much more voluntary roles in trying to coach others in and around the continent and yeah. I'm looking more at high school tournaments and trying to realize a scope in which I could make the ground square, especially from for Africans to compete. And yeah. so realizing that we came from a background where we really did not know debates beyond argumentative essays. And to see that yeah. I'm judging every weekend, um, seven year olds, 10 year olds deliver speeches that have very good quality. The fact that I have competed against such people and made finals yeah. means that if I'm able to contribute to creating a foundation that allows Africans to start debating as early as possible. We, yeah, I think we are the next big thing in world, but yeah, we have to work at being the big thing, and that's yeah. what I want to contribute to. Especially as I'm a product of the efforts that those who were there previously have achieved, I feel it's now my time to give back to the continent. Yeah, yeah. Kel, um, could you what 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 should we be expecting from you as well? So it's community leadership, much like Kelvin mentioned. But I, I personally, I do not think that <laughs> I, I'm done, and and that's because I mean, you know, for the most for all the things that I can say I've done in my career, other people yeah. have also done. So I'm not the first. I'm probably the second or the third, and so the third person to win nationals back to back, the second person to win PADC and nationals. Um, Wache has three trophies for Ken USD. I also have three trophies. And so this particular season was just my time to maybe get something that I could hold as the first. Your own, um, yeah. Exactly. 
And so this is something that I kept pondering over even after the, the finals, because I have a 60% spin rate at the institutional final. It could still go higher. <laughs> it could yeah, still go higher. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone, I don't know, I don't know, maybe if someone has 60% to, a person could reach out to create a club <laughs> or something. I have zero, but, zero percent. <laughs> So, at institutional final zero. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm going to also, I mean, to, to do that, I'll have to, I want to also, like, I would invest some time in being a community leader. Um, I've been appointed yeah. um, chief education roles just so I, and that's because I do very few tournaments in a calendar year. Yeah. And because of that too, I also do not have much time to invest mm-hmm. in new talents in the, the continent. But yeah. this time around, I think I'm, I'm open to stressing myself just so I can invest more into other people. Um, so I'm going to, you're going to see me taking more um, chief education roles, more coaching roles. And most likely, you're going to see me in more tournaments that even previously I had not done because I was just focusing on myself and growing. But now, so more than ever, even if I'm not at where I want to be, I know that there is also a significant amount of um, resources that comes with being where I am, and I have yeah. to, I have to give, give back. And maybe if there's time again, I'll try to increase my institutional tournament win rates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like we, we always say that the society made us who we are, and mm-hmm. it's equally down to us to make the next generation um, who exactly. they are. I, I, I was built up by the likes of. Um, BNI, JJ, Erasmus, Eric, um, who gave me all the help I need, like to to grow up when I was starting up, like you guys, um, Prosper, Calvin, Banaman, to some mm-hmm. degree myself, so Erasmus, like Chip Dean, mm-hmm. the next batch of debaters, um, Desmond, for instance, is more heavy under. Uh, you prosper and and the likes of the like the big boys around Calvin and all that. So debate has always been about generations passing down the knowledge and the experience. And with you guys um, being like the most elite debaters Africa has right now, you would probably be the best people to to hand down some of these things. So obviously, um, it would be good and it's good news for the community to hear that we should expect more involvement from from you as well. Um, final words to anyone who is who listens to this episode, to people that you care about, to people from your communities as well. Um, what would you like to tell them, uh, Kelvin? So first, I just want to say a very big shout out to the Courtney. She competed as opposition member in the 2016 AUGC Open final. And just like me, she did not win. But there's a large consensus that she was the best speaker in that final. And starting out in the debate, it was the speech that made me realize that this is the kind of debater I want to become. The debater that always has the crowd, the debater that relates to people in the simplest of forms. And looking, at, I'm not saying looking back, but Looking at me now, I have yeah. got to go, and I just want to thank them for showing up and being the best that they could be. The second is to yeah. say that um, to everyone watching, it's achievable. You can be the best ESL final speaker, open final speaker. You just have to get there and, and, and attend the tournament. We would also like to call on institutions to leadership of institutions to give their debaters a chance to represent. Yeah. And for any institution that is scared that their debaters are not ready because they lack training, because they lack certain logistics. KNSCB is committed to give back. Um, So for whosoever needs any kind of help, we are committed to help as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much um, as well. Could you, uh, what would be your final words? 
Okay, I'll, I'll begin by giving a context to this interview in particular. Even if you had interviewed the ESO finalists from last year, I think Kelvin and I would still be the people whom you have interviewed with the least number of years spent in, in debating. And so we'll probably be into four years of debates next February, I, yeah. I, I guess. And, uh, and we are on, on this show that is meant to discuss important people who have done a lot for African debating. It yeah. goes on to say that debating it's now more than ever more centralized and so regardless of the number of years you have spent in debating you can first of all find your own path regardless of what most people are doing and so for people like me who do not go for every tournament i'm still on this show i found my own path kelvin found his own yeah. path on the kind of speaker he wants to be and how he's going to assess himself and insofar yeah. as we had the goal that we want to be one of the best Africa has been insofar as we saw people like you, Erasmus, and were able to dream that we could make it work. It worked for us. So if you are watching this, you have to dream as big as you can, and then you find your own path is going to work out eventually. But even if you are going to look at us and say that you should be able to achieve this within four years, there are also other stories of people that achieved this in six years, five years or more. And so for whatever you are, you have a community, you are not alone. You could be like us, you could be like all the other people that have been interviewed. Just dream and find your own path and you are going to make it. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, guys. Um, and thanks to everyone who has tuned in to, to listen to this interview. It's been an amazing conversation. Um, it's been a really interesting one also, like getting a good sense of your journeys, your stories, and your individual inspirations as well. And, and I hope this is um, an episode that inspires the next generation of people who would interview as WDC champions, WDC best speakers, and hopefully like even you guys could return as champions of WDC as well on, on this show. So um, there's there's no possibility that we are crossing out. But yeah, thanks to everyone. Um, thanks for this amazing episode and see you on the next one.